If you do drop out or have issues, um, we will provide a recording after this session. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning for Making Digital Health Real. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land upon which we're coming to you um, today. And I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I'd just like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty is never ceded. This morning, we're very fortunate to have um, Professor Karen Thursky, who some of you may know as CAS as well, who is Director of the National Centre of the Antimicrobial Stewardship and Centre and Clinical Director of the Guidance Group at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, she is the Associate Director of Health Services Research and Implementation Science at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Principal Fellow in the Department of Medicine at the University of Melbourne and the Sir Peter McCallum Department of Oncology. This morning we're really fortunate um, because CAS has both is both nationally and internationally recognised as an expert in this field. Um, and so we're fortunate to have her come on board and um, provide her journey and story and speak to some of uh, the projects with regards to knowledge translation in learning health systems. Um, Kaz, I'd love to hand over to you. Thank you, Meg. And um, I do know lots of you who are watching. So I hope that this is stuff that you may not have heard me talk about before, because when Meg asked me to talk, I thought, well, maybe I'll really go back to where I started when I was an infectious diseases registrar and, and where we've got to now. And so welcome to all of you. And I hope that you know, mine was, uh, I guess I was explaining to Meg, I didn't know that what I was doing was knowledge translation, learning health, but I certainly do now. And I can tell you that um, it really underpins the philosophy of how I try and uh, improve healthcare now. So I have um, a wonderful team. Um, so of my many hats, <laughs> one of my hats is leading this department that's based across the Doherty. This is not everyone. You can see we're an amazing multicultural group. We're a mix of clinicians, microbiologists. Um, you know, the clinicians include senior and microbiologist pharmacists. We have quality management, business development, software engineers. Um, and and I, I love this group. And this group has grown with me and we have had people who have come and gone. But it's important to recognise particularly the original team that that um, kicked off this work, including Kirsty Busing, who many of you will know. So um, the guidance program, which really is around developing uh, information technology to support antimicrobial stewardship. And when I talk about antimicrobial stewardship, this is really a, a set of processes to rationalise antimicrobial use. Um, it is a key part of a national AMR strategy. It really informs how we practise at a clinical level and what sort of governance and processes need to be around that. So that might include national initiative, initiatives around dedicated accreditation frameworks, right down to um, what's the decision support required for a prescriber to make sure they're prescribing the right antimicrobials and how do we audit that and how we feedback that. And so this um, group was generated through um, grants originally, became a standalone department. And I'm going to talk to you about how we went from, you know, a grant and an original application through to this um, system, which has now been deployed across Australian hospitals and how that has generated the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship, which is also a research group, which is a One Health group. So I had the f great fortune to be working with amazing vets, um, GPs, uh, people in aged care, driving this One Health approach to improving antimicrobial stewardship. So just coming back to that concept of a learning healthcare system, um, ultimately we want to create a healthcare system that recognises that we need to have appropriate um, clinical pathways of care. And you can't do that without understanding how antimicrobials are used and actually for the end users to understand how they're used, um, which will inform decision support programs, clinical pathways, and then understanding how we can effect, effectively evaluate them. So this is the overarching framework. And what I'm going to be facing, um, focusing on today is really, you know, my journey in developing computerised decision support. 
So underpinning all of our work at the moment is that we have um, the opportunity to work um, very closely with the National Centre. So while we're developing technology, we do actually have a research framework around what we do. And so I guess I'm very fortunate in that sense. But this concept of continuous improvement is really important. You know, there is no system in healthcare that you can build, set and forget. You need to be constantly thinking about, is it fit for purpose? What are the unintended consequences? Are we measuring those? What are the end users doing? Is there is there issues? How do we have to grow with emerging digital health, such as electronic health records? And so that'll come through the talk today. So what got me into this? And I've told this to Wendy before, it was this New England Journal of Medicine paper. And this was from the LDS Hospital in Utah, where Wendy came from. And they had this homegrown decision support tool that um, provided recommendations and dosing and ordering of antimicrobials. And they tested it in the ICU when it was obviously very effective. And the accompanying editorial called the Holy Grail. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. So I actually visited LDS and I, I saw it and I and I inquired about it and I thought, can we buy it for Royal Melbourne Hospital? And uh, at that time, it was not transferable. It was written in a homegrown language and uh, they had a data dictionary, but not much else. And I thought, oh, okay, but obviously this concept is really important. So maybe I can look at something to, maybe I can look at an opportunity to develop some decision support. So what I did next is probably my most favourite ever project. We, um, I was very fortunate to be to meet Michael Mayamoff, and he was at the time a final year software engineer and human factors engineer from University of Melbourne, and we talked about how we could try and work out what was actually going on in our ICU to understand if we were going to build a system, what it would actually look like. And he elected to use a, a user-centered approach called contextual analysis, which at the time was typically being used in business management circles. But ultimately the process is an ethnographic one where he spent three months observing communications within the ICU observing what things were being used actually to prescribe antimicrobials, observing the culture and um, observing the flow. And so what you can see on the top left there is a consolidated model, but you can see that all roads point to the resident and the registrar. Um, but on the bottom right, you can see that the black line around culture shows that the black lines are equal between the resident and the registrar and the nurse and anyone who knows ICU knows how important that culture is to understand how important it is that all the stakeholders around the patient is um, are taken into account. And you can see that the patient there is not at the centre. That's a little bit surprising, isn't it? Because when we learn about healthcare, we, we're trying to do patient-centred, but here we are, we can see it's a user-centred um, consolidated chart. This process really identify what they were desperately needing and we knew that they were spending hours and hours collating information I think that's probably still a true statement even though we have a fancy electronic medical record but still collating information for ward rounds um, and we went on to develop a paper prototype using case studies and uh, went on to develop the first system which is called advise and so we at the time uh, were able to um, get information from the existing pathology information and reformat it into a meaningful way. Um, and I, believe it or not, hand-coded markup language decisions of what which took me six months of full-time coding. And I now commiserate with anyone who is a coder, but it was my sort of, you know, what I, I now I can now talk, can talk software engineer now. So I'm quite proud of myself. But anyway, it was a lot of work. And, you know, forgive the look and feel of it. This is a long time ago. But you can see that the information has been reformatted into a meaningful table. So at a glance, they can see cultures that were positive and cultures that are negative. And I've always said this to decision support. When you look at information, not having a result is equally important as having a result. Um, and this is a fundamental principle for medical care. You, you also need to know what's not happening as well what is happening. And here the system was able to provide um, directed information about what to prescribe, what to do if there was an allergy, 
um, was able to do um, drug bug um, mismatches and then provided, um, you know, knowledge base around how to prescribe. So I guess what was the impact of it? And we talk about evaluation. So there's a clinical evaluation. Was it effective? So, yes, um, this was, a, um, you know, an important um, addition to the literature at the time that we were able to um, decrease antimicrobial use, specifically some of the most high, the most broad spectrum antimicrobials dramatically reduced and we were able to save antimicrobial costs. Now, anyone who is around antibiotics know that they're actually very cheap and this is not the focus of any evaluation we do now. We try to look more at a patient level evaluation, including length of stay and things like that, but at the time we were able to demonstrate that. But more than that, um, did it actually have a long impact on antimicrobial resistance, which is really one of the key pillars of antimicrobial stewardship? And yes, indeed. And this is only one of two papers in the literature that has demonstrated that the decision support system um, has actually led to a reduction in resistance. And in particular, these are two important pathogens. So this was really exciting. And you can see some of the people on that paper. Um, Michelle Yong, who uh, is working with me across the PMAC, Kirsty at Royal Melbourne, Alan Cheng, who many of you know, uh, has been a leader in infection prevention in Australia. So that was really exciting. But was it useful? And so, well, the answer is yes, because it was the first time that they had something which actually gave them what they needed and saved them probably one to two hours a day of collating information. And, and they did use it. They used the data database, they used the drugs, it was very popular. Um, they were able to print out things that they could take an award round. And this concept of artefacts, um, I often talk about, you know, in the past was paper, paper, um, you know, the paper medical record, um, paper sheets going round. So these days, they still do it, but it's actually a collated worksheet out of Epic or their mobile phone. Doctors still need something to take with them on rounds. It's going to be meaningful for them. But importantly, we were we learned a lot about usability and that went into our next project because following this, we were funded through a business innovations fund grant to actually progress to a web-based platform. And this is really where we um, moved into the broader hospital space to develop up an antimicrobial stewardship platform, which was originally called Guidance DS, Decision Support. And it was first launched at Royal Melbourne in 2005, so quite a long time ago. And what I'm going to cover now is really that journey, how we went um, and what have we done over the last, um, you know, 15 years or so, or even longer. And you're going to be wondering, well, did Advise survive? Well, the trouble was that the microbiology information that came from the legacy pathology system was not in a standardised format. And, in, and aggregating and using micro information because it's a highly complex um, data set of atomic results that's not all atomic and we didn't have NLP at the time, it was impossible to transfer that to other systems and to sustain it. And when there was a change in pathology system, it was just too difficult. So despite my best efforts, I had to put aside the micro, the, the microbiology part of guidance and we focused more on developing up a stewardship workflow. And this stewardship workflow is really um, underpins what we have done ever since. What does it look like? Well, essentially in all hospitals, we typically use a traffic light approach to advise prescribers which antimicrobials are highly restricted which ones are restricted and which ones are unrestricted. If it is restricted, amber or red, there is an expectation that they either have a pre-approval or approval to be able to use that. And the reason we choose those is because these are antimicrobials of clinical importance. They might be toxic, they might be highly associated antimicrobial resistance, and they're often broad spectrum or unnecessary for common infections that patients are coming with. The second component of guidance has always been decision support. And uh, in the past, what we did was we had a, a, a set of knowledge that we developed up in an, what was developed by Jim Black as an open source DSML builder. So they had to build out their content and each site that adopted guidance would spend months on end collate, developing up their own content or modifying the content. This is a big burden on the end user. And over the years, we have realized that we need to be supporting that knowledge management. 
Um, the third part is antimicrobial review. Who are the other stakeholders that are looking at a patient's prescribing? Not just the doctors prescribing it, but it's a pharmacist who need to review and dispense it, and the nurses that need to understand that what has been chosen is appropriate. And we always talk about antimicrobial use being everybody's problem, and therefore we need to have a system that actually supports all the end users, that so-called learning community inside the hospital. The fourth group is a very important group. This is usually a funded program, you know, and it's hard and expensive to build this up because you actually need experts to support antimicrobial review. So we call this the antimicrobial stewardship team. Um, how do they see who's on what and why? What's the best way for them to use their time? They're always busy. They don't have enough time. Um, and how can they can use this information to provide real-time audit and feedback? And finally, what is the data that comes out of the system to actually support program improvement at a high level? What information do we need to feed back to our executives, unit managers, um, to the doctors to continue improve prescribing? So this is our, our approach to stewardship. And so guidance um, was um, first launched in 2005. And and yes, it was very effective. And this particular publication has been cited hundreds of times. Um, it was picked up by New England Journal Medical um, Journal Watch for Infectious Diseases as an example of a successful program. And we, we actually won the um, Premier's Healthcare Award um, in 2006. We, you know, I think we did um, create something which um, was really uh, useful and meaningful. But not only that, our work with this actually help to drive the national accreditation framework. So a really nice example of health services research that improve, has improved policy and practice. Now, again, when I look at this, I sort of cringe at the look of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can see that we had built out a tool that was, um, you know, provided um, approvals, uh, deci actual decision support, including uh, calculators and uh, clinical risk rules, um, help to drive the appropriate dose and link through to national guidelines. But on the right-hand side, that, that spreadsheet really is around how do we get to see the right patients? And we, we created this sort of triaging process where we selected serious indications, uh, drugs of high importance, particularly when there was a non-standard indication because um, often junior doctors um, are told to prescribe something even though it's not part of a guideline because a senior prescriber. So it's very hard to get to the decision makers sometimes for clinical practice. And we had some cool things in there, including um, uh, doctors who did their, after a certain number of approvals, they would get a coffee voucher, um, which was like a reward. And that was actually really popular. And, and unfortunately, we haven't kept it in today's guidance, but I, I, they always loved it. And they were very sad. They said, Where's the, why aren't we getting awards anymore? The pharmacists would often get, get the rewards, which is pretty cool. Um, but importantly, this um, whole system uh, grew over time. And um, one of the important things to demonstrate, I think, which is really exciting is when you're presenting decision support, our users need to understand how a decision is made. It cannot be black box. And so when we're thinking about our future with AI, it's probably a bit of a way away for users to totally accept a black box recommendation for something they need to understand where it's come from. Um, and so one of the um, really great findings is that we were able to demonstrate our, that our um, pneumonia um, severity calculator um, in the IC, in the um, emergency department did actually improve quality of prescribing. Um, and again, the users could see how um, they got to that decision and gave that kind of confidence in, in being able to prescribe, uh, you know, appropriate antimicrobials. And that does not, did not always mean uh, kept tracked in azithromycin. They, they were able to prescribe more narrow spectrum such as benzoyl penicillin. Um, but what about its usability? What did we do and how do we use that information to improve the system? So uh, Tibish Zaidi was a PhD fellow um, through Monash University who came and uh, wanted to evaluate the system. Um, and so he undertook uh, a series of um, usability studies. And one was a questionnaire, which we were not involved in, uh, where he, uh, he uh, in, uh, which was participated by um, 
with participation from the prescribers across the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And you can see that there was a strong belief that the system increased their knowledge, reduced inappropriateness, increased their adherence and um, improved the communication, which is great. It was great for us. Um, but there are obviously some issues around how it was um, fitted into their daily workflow and what could be improved. And so he followed up with a what we call a formative evaluation, which was a focus group approach where he thematically analysed um, ways to improve the system. This was directly fed back to the development team, which of course was inside Royal Melbourne. It was a small team. And so this is how we use that information to develop the next version of guidance, which was guidance MS. And this is a screenshot of some of um, guidance MS um, in use. This is in the intensive care unit at the Royal Melbourne with Kirsty and some of Kaz, um, um, Catherine George and Robin Ingram and, and one of the ICU intensivists, how they use it on a round and how and how it's used to um, create ward rounds, um, decision support, and then of course reporting, important reporting back into the impact. And we know that two thirds of um, two thirds of uh, patients who are seen by the stewardship round will actually have some recommendations made. So we know that systems like this are very important. What about scaling and sustainability? So guidance has been around for a long time. And we have scaled it to all sorts of places. And to give you some examples, at the Edworth Hospital, we have data coming from the uh, commercial pharmacy slades uh, going straight into guidance in the hospital to help the ph hospital pharmacists triage their board rounds. We have a model in Goulburn Valley Shepparton where they are using uh, the post-prescription post review tool to um, do remote um, telehealth at stewardship rounds um, with a local on-site pharmacist and an infectious diseases physician from Royal Melbourne supporting them. We have um, Belinda Lambros, who you all know, um, who has been using um, guidance to support their stewardship in a in a specialist hospital. And we have um, we have guidance in hospitals with and without EMRs because we this is a systems approach. EMRs are very patient-centered. So sometimes you actually do need a third party system to actually allow a systems approach to um, monitoring antimicrobials across the organization. So we we are well aware of the different models of care. When you're developing something, <clears throat> any platform, you need to know what will be the drivers of uptake. Sometimes it is around a sense of urgency and AMR has always been, antimicrobial resistance has obviously been a key driver for organisations, but sometimes legislation and accreditation are really important too. So in Victoria, um, at, at fairly early on, there was a mandate recommendation as part of the infection control strategy that hospitals needed to adopt an approval and monitoring program. Um, and that had to include restriction, et cetera, decision-making algorithms. So this is really a major driver for its uptake in uh, Victoria and uh, other states like New South Wales also adopted a, a, a similar position. At the same time, there were national accreditation standards being developed um, in Australia, and these standards are very um, granular compared to accreditation frameworks um, uh, internationally. And we in Australia have a dedicated stewardship um, standard, which includes the recommendation that there needs to be restriction rules and approval processes, access to evidence-based guidelines, uh, that we incorporate clinical care standards that support antimicrobial um, review. And really, this is talking about some of those elements that I explained to you earlier on, on how guidance works. So this, again, was another driver for sites to look at, well, what can we do? What can we use? Another piece of um, information which I think is really fundamentally important, again, this is something that we realised very early on, is, you know, how... If a site is interested, what are the chances that they they will actually be able to put it into their hospital? You can have the most keen pharmacists and um, you know stewardship teams, and they really want to have the system in place, but there are many barriers and facilitators as why that may or may not happen. And we developed up a framework 
uh, uh, for readiness assessment, for adopting electronic stewardship programs, which have continued to use today in how we actually implement guidance. And part of it is the technical readiness, the IT infrastructure, the servers, the people available to do it, their resource readiness, and that can be both financial and human resources. Is there a project officer that can be focused on implementing the program? Because this is not a plug and play. This is a system that takes a number of months um, to actually um, make sure that the local site has um, is happy with their content and that there's appropriate education, uh, education and training. Um, do they have an implementation plan? What's their existing program? Um, obviously, if there's an existing program, it's much easier to bring in a digital support tool. If there's not, then we need to work with them to build one. Um, what are the culture and the administrative and executive support? So this is really, really important for any system, particularly coming one that would be wanting to go into an electronic health record environment. So what were some of the barriers? Well, you know, none of this will be a surprise to you. So we have, um, you know, there was often, um, you know, despite the fact that they wanted these things, there, there was it was hard to engage the state or jurisdictions. Um, despite the fact that these systems are hospital-wide benefit in terms of length of stay, reduced IC admission, um, reduced costs, the costs were often ha had to be borne by single departments. And this is one of the challenges of healthcare, healthcare I think, at the moment. Um, contracts always took ages. They were expected to deploy the existing resources. Their project teams, you know, change management is a, is a skill set which we need to be teaching um, and hopefully um, you will get that in your learning health course, um, local IT skill sets and then stewardship. And, you know, I could go on, but, you know, really um, resources and readiness, uh, as I explained earlier, are really key here. But what what can trigger early adoption? Well, first of all, having a sense of urgency is paramount because you can then make the case to executive who would support it. Influential clinical opinion leaders are always really important. And those teams that have a very clear understanding of how to understand project implementation, change management, um, using um, a good use of media and strategies, adequate resources, um, really, uh, I think, uh, ways of making sure that your system is going to be taken up. So just a little case study. This is Royal Hobart that um, had at the time a big budget, a uh, big antimicrobial budget, $2 million. It was 20% of the drug budget. They were very concerned with the rising costs of their antimicrobials. At the time, they were struggling with VRE outbreak. And so they had approached us and they were one of our early adopters to put guidance in. They actually developed up a, a lovely lovely stewardship program that was labelled Enhance. And this is Duncan McKenzie, who now has a senior role in the Tasmanian Health Department, who was one of the first antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists in Australia, who drove the Antara Anderson and who drove the adoption of guidance in Tassie, launched in 2009. You can see on the right-hand side that their costs reduced and they have gone on to have a statewide license and guidance is used across the state and continues to be used to this day. So we do have an approach and we have a pretty much a 360 um, implementation where we look at um, once it's approved, we set up a project team, we plan it out carefully, we make sure that the members of the project team include IT, clinical, um, pharmacy executives, and we carefully make sure that everyone is on the same page. Again, that's what we would call the learning health community here. We actually, the technical team work to install and configure the guidance to the local site requirements, include linking it to their patient information systems or dynamic links with the EHR, with that CERNA, EPIC. Um, we work for a long time pre-launch with the content because we know that decision support that is local adaptation is really, really important. There will be no clinical guideline that would be um, completely taken up lock, stock and barrel in ID because of the case mix and complexities, local formularies, et cetera. Um, the, the communication education plan is really important. 
Um, and then we plan for go live. We have no lo, go, no go. And really we have quite a formalised process now. And, and I don't know if Nanha is online, but a shout out to Nanha um, who uh, leads this work with me, with us at Royal Melbourne. Um, and we have um, also ongoing support model, which is triage in terms of level of urgency. So... And we've gone on and now these are the sites where guidance is and you can see there's a mix of rural, regional, private, as well as um, some of the New South Wales hospitals. And a shout out to New South Wales because they were a site that actually have established it as a multi-hospital system. It's a, it's a networked implementation, so a single instance of guidance that is used by multiple networks. Um, amazing, amazing people, including the paediatric network, really um, have been great um, leaders, I think, in stewardship nationally and, and hopefully should be recognised for that. Now I'm going to go on to, uh, you know, the world of digital health now and where things, where systems like guidance fit into the electronic medical record and to electronic health, rec electronic medical management, because those of us who have been working with CERN and EPIC understand that these systems are primarily de designed to be patient-centric Whereas infection surveillance software, infection prevention uh, or antimicrobial approval systems were, uh, really function at more um, systems level in terms of collating data. And inside stewardship programs, there is very sensitive information about appropriateness of use, which um, sh surely there are medico-legal implications about some of this information that will be sitting next to a patient's record. And so there needs to be a tool that allows communication with the antimicrobial stewardship team and the doctors that may not sit inside a patient record, um, and also the ability to provide that decision support. Um, now, one of the things about electronic um, medical records is things only get captured when they're ordered. And pre-restriction or pre-approvals is really around trying to inform decision-making before the order is made. So neither um, EPIC or CERN or other um, electronic health records are very good at actually allowing that decision-making process because that only kind of gets triggered when you choose a drug, when we need to happen the other way around. And so recognising where decision support needs to happen, um, it's not possibly not their key focus. Um, we are challenged with um, particularly New South Wales with different um, systems build and different builds. And in fact, even with the precinct build of EPIC, the different, different, slightly different approaches and different builds. And then of course their business operations, which is we don't want third party systems, but recognizing I think that is important that there are specialist workflows that may require uh, implementation or integration or interoperability with these systems. So the next piece is around trying to harmonise how we approach it and then obviously the cost of um, customisation of a, a large electronic health record versus being able to be flexible and agile with a third party system. So this is, you know, these, these are real issues and while I'm talking about an antimicrobial stewardship program, I'm sure there are many of you online who are struggling with proms and uh, virtual monitoring and, and devices and da da da, da. So, you know, the, I think the lessons are the same whether it's with, uh, you know, a system like guidance or not. So we have taken a system, we have, we are taking a systems approach. We recognise that the electronic medical record is absolutely the source of truth. But there is an opportunity for us to support the prescribing process, the approvals, the decision support, the ward round support, and make and try where we can to have that interoperability and seamless integration. And hopefully we'll be kicking off with the project with the Validatron, with Kit and Daniel, where we can actually look at CDS hooks to actually enhance that interface. Um, I think it's a really important piece of work um, and really, you know, hopefully leading the way in how this can be done. The blue circle around the edge I'm not talking about today, but we understand that there needs to be common language around how we talk about antimicrobials in Australia. And we have done this through the NAPS, which I'm not talking about today, but this is a National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey platform. It's a web-based platform. It's used by um, over 5,000 auditors. It's used by most hospitals these days to do an uh, annual um, prescribing survey. And in fact, many hospitals have done it recently. 
and we have built out an indications list, which is SNOMED coded. We work with the Digital Health Agency um, and it's core to the knowledge base in guidance. So trying to understand indications and having a common language about indications in across Australia, I think is really important if we're going to be building out you know, true data, interoperability data sharing around how patients are being managed. So what happens when you put a system like guidance into an EMR? And so um, Prince of Wales, of course, had a standalone guidance before because they, again, were early adopters. But when it was integrated with their SONA as a dynamic link, you can see that uptick in the approvals um, in the blue at the top there. But most importantly, which I think is really important, is that you can see down the bottom is their NAPS results looking at probiness prescriptions. And you can see that once the um, system was um, integrated, you, you continued to see an increase in appropriateness of prescribing. This to me is a really important outcome measure demonstrating effectiveness of your system. This is the local um, experience in Royal Melbourne with a dynamic link, which obviously showed if you can integrate a system at least partially, you will actually see improved performance. Um, Evaluation of these systems is really great. And, and this in this situation, it was not by our team. This was by the New South Wales team that I talked about before, um, South East Sydney Area Network, where they looked at the impact of a, a network-wide installation of guidance and impact on um, patient outcomes and antimicrobial resistance. And, you know, they looked at this um, five years after guidance was deployed to show that antimicrobial use decreased that in, uh, C. diff infections decreased and and, at, and over that time, um, gram-negative resistance declined. Now, there are other factors at play here, but at the end of the day, um, this is really um, important outcomes that um, those sites will use to ensure that there's ongoing endorsement um, of their program. So guidance has been around for a long time and, you know, it was, it was very nice for us to be around when the Centre for Digital Transformation of Health um, was open because it really did open our eyes into how we can better do the redesign. And so I'm going to talk to you now about what we've been actually doing to redesign the program using the Applied Learning Health Healthcare System Framework. And um, you can see we had the existing system and how we're going to develop new guidance. And very importantly, we do have an amazing learning health community because we have had users that have been using guidance for 15 years from across Australia. We already have established community. We have end users. We also have access to prescribers. Um, and so for years and years, we would, we would run regular forums to understand what they wanted if we were going to redesign it. What was your wish list? And we carefully went through that to understand what would be feasible, um, how we would develop the application, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the redesign project really, as I said, was based on years of experience. So it wasn't new. Um, we knew that um, the burden of developing the content for many sites was huge. And we made a big decision. I still remember the day we decided that are we going to be um, in the content management business? You know, are we going to be actually developing decision support and managing and maintaining decision support? It, this is a single reason why many decision support systems fail because they're unable to maintain and support the knowledge base that runs behind them. And we thought, well, yes, we do because, you know, it's unfair to push that uh, content management back onto the sites when we can actually build out a centralised model. So that was a big decision. The second thing is we, we know that guidance could support the clinical care standards and we were able to um, leverage the existing accreditation framework to make sure there was very fit for purpose. So pretty much every hospital that has guidance in place um, uh, does really, really well during accreditation because it actually meets all the requirements for that. Um, but building in assessments and helping that decision support towards appropriateness is really key and kind of informed how we were going to develop this decision support. And then, of course, you know, data wrangling for stewardship teams is massive and they spend enormous amounts of time making Excel spreadsheets and this and this and KPIs. So really trying to understand better 
visualization of stewardship programs and a program is again was a key driver. And then finally, and this is an ongoing challenge, how can we optimize the integration inter interoperability with pharmacy systems and EMR systems? Now, the next thing that happened was a big thing. And, you know, a word of caution for everyone online if you decide to do software. The TJ um, we knew was coming up with recommendations around software as a medical device. And in the initial iteration, and this is the latest one, we knew that we could well be regulated as a software as a medical device. And what does that mean? Well, actually, there need, there's an enormous amount of back-end quality system documentation processes and reports and audits um, uh, that need to be done. And it needs uh, resourcing, it needs additional platforms, and we already had some in place because our team has been 9001 accredited for a few years now. But this was a big issue. And it delayed our redevelopment by about a year because we spent a long time trying to understand where we would, where we would fall. And for all of you online, this is something that you need to be doing very early on because the documentation required to prospectively develop up your um, system into to clinical use, you have to take this into account. And we uh, finally, and then, so we, we proceeded as though we were, and then about a year later, um, they updated their recommendations and we have been deemed an exempt medical device, but we still need to register and we need still need to meet the so-called essential principles. Um, I'm always happy to talk to people offline about this, but really it was a it, it's a big thing with a capital B <laughs> because it, it puts hundreds of thousand additional dollars into the the costs of your team to develop up your system to be able to be registered as an exempt medical device. So the second thing we learned is that usability is really important. And we, I would, uh, you know, we love Shri. Shri is amazing. And I hope that she can present to you one day because she is not only an amazing um, graphic designer, but she's a user interface, user expert, um, user experience expert. And we really um, redesigned first and foremost understanding who are going to be our end users and this is really where we created these personas who is going to be using and how they use it what was their personality what was their motivation for using the system um, and these some of the personas that we developed along the bottom and we would add in management as well and it really streamlined how we undertook our usability testing with our end users by using these personas so again something to think about the next thing is this knowledge management. And uh, I mentioned to you before that we had a, a tool that was uh, open source built by Jim Black. Um, it was a WYSI, what we call a WYSIWYG tool. And this is the same, um, you know, you could switch between a table view and, um, and a, and a um, graphic view of the guideline. This has been an enormous achievement by our team. We, we use an onshore, offshore, offshore development, which means you have senior project team um, who understand guidance working onshore with me at the Doherty, as well as an offshore team building out the system. It requires a lot of interaction, but this tool actually um, allows clinicians, so you do not need to go to IT at all to do the decision support. So this allows complete clinician control of building out a clinical guideline to support the restrictions and approvals process. And in some ways, we've done what we've done here is to look at antimicrobial prescribing, but the tool is actually agnostic and could be used for any domain. Uh, it's a really amazing system and you can you can preview it and then publish it to your own site um, in your own guidance. So it sits within guidance and you can um, you know, navigate in and out of it to update your content. So if there is a drug shortage, you can go in and actually immediately um, adapt your guideline. Um, just some screenshots now just to show you. Um, one of the major requirements for our users is that, well, you know, we know we've always prescribed our antimicrobial because can we prescribe our indication as well? And this is why we had to go into that knowledge decision support piece because, you know, junior prescribers need to know what to do for a diabetic foot infection. We don't immediately want them to go to a broad spectrum antimicrobial. And so how, helping them to navigate these um, decision support is really important. 
we have developed a system which is both um, can be used on a desktop as well as um, mobile views. And you can see how everything happens one after another. And so it steps them through the key questions and directly links them to the current therapeutic guidelines that not having to navigate in and out of national or local guidelines. We have created review um, post prescription review workflows so that they can manage their antimicrobial stewardship rounds. But there are often different sorts of rounds. So there might be around in ICU, there might be around in hematology oncology ward, there might be around in surgery. And so that ability to have multiple different work ward round workflows is really key. Um, and equally, how we assess the quality of prescribing. Of course, being uh, the NAPS team or the National Animal Prescribing Survey team, we can actually build in those NAPS metrics into the reports. And the reports themselves use a, a business intelligence platform called Tableau, which means you can dynamically adapt and um, develop reports that are going to be meaningful to the stewardship team, but also um, for um, reporting to quality and safety stewardship um, committees, etc. And these are very interactive and dynamic and are hugely time saving. Um, well, the next step is, well, we've got that. And now we're, we're at that point where we need to think about evaluation. I'm not going to go into detail today. But again, this has come out through the literature that, you know, many decision support, they're not really investigating how, why are they successful? And so, again, um, with help from um, Centre for Digital Transformation of Health, which they've been really critical here, we've been developing up the systems and the frameworks that we're going to be using to do the socio-technical technical, technical evaluation. We're going to use the UTALK framework, but also we're going to be looking at the clinical elevation and health economic evaluation in these systems as well, often not reported. Um, just as I'm finishing off, I just wanted to a shout out to Zoha Rashid Zado, who is a senior antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist who've joined our team recently, um, who won the uh, Bestie poster at the BMJ International Forum on Quality and Safety. And this is really actually highlighting how we need to be optimising these systems in the EMR era. Um, you know, just a, a great recognition of... Um, you know, some of the challenges that um, many of you probably are facing in thinking how to integrate. And my last slide is for you, who many of you who will have seen this, and looking at this, this is the Learning Health short, short course or the course, um, you will see some of the things that I've covered today, you know, how to identify the problem, what sort of system you're going to design, what are the pro how would you do a prototype and how would you evaluate it and how will it inform the next steps um, and then you can see how we went from advice through to guidance and then we've continued to improve it and also to build in a lot more robustness in how we're actually developing particularly around knowledge management and uh, decision support uh, and then usability and I hope that you know it might be a different domain from what you're working in but I hope that your takeaway from today is that, you know, you, you can do it, but you need to, you know, I guess be carefully thinking about those elements of your um, knowledge translation cycle. So I'm going to stop sharing.